everyone, and welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Woo, y'all, early voting is underway. You now have the opportunity to save democracy and keep white Christian nationalists out of our state house. You have the right to do that. You can do it right now. Well, not right now, because I'm certain the, the city county building is closed. But you can go down to the city county building, cast your vote for people who believe that everyone has the right to exist just the way they are. They won't ban books. They want to take care of our public teachers and our public schools. They want women to have the right to body autonomy. You now, you, you out there listening to me, watching Turn Left have the opportunity in Indiana to go out there and cast your vote and have your voices heard. We can do it, y'all. We can do it. And so, Marion County is hosting a get out the vote rally on the 26th. I know Fort Wayne, Allen County, theirs is at 10 a.m. Ours is at 1 p.m. So that we can get out the vote and motivate and encourage people to do what they want to do, which is save our democracy. Because the other team right now, the other team is full of lies. They're full of hate and misery and uh, grievances. The other side is not listening to you. They don't care about you because if they would cared about you, they would listen to you. But that whole other ticket is an orange menace waiting to happen. It's an orange menace waiting to happen. You know, uh, I feel for the folks in um, Southeast America because the hurricanes have been absolutely brutal. There have been loss of life and obviously uh, loss of property. And my heart, and I imagine everyone who's listening, uh, their hearts go out to all those folks who are struggling and just trying to maintain and find a way uh, to get through these hurricanes. And our national government has stepped in to make sure things are happening. So for example, something that was uh, implemented during the Biden-Harris campaign was an immediate $750, <clears throat> excuse me, to every person so they can take care of basic needs like diapers for their children, like formula, like just the deodorant, <laughs> toothpaste, the little things that you need right now that you had to leave behind. But the, the Republicans, they wanna lie about it. They wanna lie and say that FEMA's not there and FEMA doesn't have enough money, excuse me. That is not true. This is a, well, that $750 is a one-time payment. <clears throat> but the orange people wanna tell you that FEMA's run out of money. But what they don't wanna tell you is no, they have not run out of money, but Republicans also voted against giving FEMA more money for disaster. The orange people, this is how much they care about you. During the height of the pandemic, the orange people were giving our enemies COVID tests. The orange people have been, since then, since he's been out of office, has been having private conversations with, the, with Putin. You know, the guy that decided that Ukraine doesn't deserve to be Ukraine and invaded that nation and is killing people. <clears throat> That's his homeboy. That's who he wants to be like. He wants to be an authoritarian. And Mike Braun? That's his minion. That's his minion. So if J.D. Vance and Micah Beckwith are mirror images of each other. Except for one is a proclaimed white Christian nationalist and then suggests that everybody else should be one too. So what I'm saying to y'all is this, now is the time. We are at a turning point in the history of this great experiment. 
those of us who don't mind reading history recognize that this has happened multiple times in multiple countries around the globe. This is not the first time this has happened. It happened in Russia. It's happened in Italy. It has happened in Germany. And in all those cases, when the authoritarian has won, it didn't work out for some people. They literally tried to exterminate the Jews. It has happened in Turkey. Erdogan is now, whatever his name is, is now the tyrant in, in Turkey. We see what happens when we allow authoritarians to seize control of our nations. Your rights go down the drain. They go down the drain. And can I, can I just, come, come here, come here. Can I, can I talk to my white brothers and sisters for, for just a minute? I know if this election doesn't go the way that you think it should go, <clears throat> you're going to blame black people and you're going to blame Hispanic people and you're going to blame other marginalized groups. I know that's what you're going to do because that's what you do. But I want to be really clear about one thing. And you take this back to your homies. Take this back to your cousin. Take this back to Mima. Democrats have not won the white vote since 1968. Say what? What you, what you, what you talking about? What you, what you saying? What you saying, Dana Black? White people have overwhelmingly, as a majority, voted for the Republican Party with their Southern strategy, with their we don't want everybody to vote, with their violence against minorities who wanted to go to the polls, with their poll taxes, with their let's, uh, uh, let's make private, let's make private Social Security, let's put it on the stock market. Let's defund public education, white people. I need you to see the humanity of other humans that live in this country who also contribute to the greatness of this country. I need you to stop putting your fears that we are looking for retribution for past harms to our communities. We ain't looking for that. We just want to be free. We just want to have body out. We want to be left the hell alone. That's what we want. We ain't trying to take what you got. And by the way, there's enough sun for everyone to shine. There's enough. Our nation is the greatest nation on the planet, not just because we have incredible military might, not just because we have the, an, an economy that's the envy of the world. Now, don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not foolish. I recognize the history of America. My last name is Black. I'm also a rainbow warrior. So listen, I get it. But I also know that because of the greatness of our country, we have seen massive changes. When it took 75 years plus from Seneca Falls to the 19th Amendment. This doesn't happen without male allies. We see with the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the um, Fair Housing Act that ensured that black citizens were 100% and full participants in this government, it took white allies. We knew for gay marriage to pass, we needed straight allies. So we know it's in you. We know you have the capacity to do what's right. We know. And trust me, if we do this thing the right way this year, everyone is going to prosper. It may not be at the same pace, and it may not be at the same level, and it may not be at the same clip. But I guarantee you one thing, what, 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 what will happen if they win? They're going to ban books. They're going to modify history. They're going to deny gay folks the right to exist because they're already trying to legislate us away as it is, especially my trans community. They're going to do a lot of things. They, you know they're talking about bringing gay marriage back to the states. You know, it's all the things. When I hear states' rights, I, I have DNA trauma from states' rights. I just want you all to understand that. So my what I'm doing right now is I'm begging. <laughs> I ain't too proud to beg. 
I need y'all to see the humanity of people. We ain't trying to take nothing you got. But if you vote for the orange menace, Mike Braun and Micah Beckwith, you're basically saying we don't exist to you and our rights don't matter. Because don't tell me it's just the economy that is going to make you throw away this amazing experiment of, of, of citizen-led government. We all have a say in this government. We all have a say. So I implore you, I encourage you, when you go to vote, think about the future. Think like Liz Cheney and I don't have nothing in common. Not a thing. Like I don't even understand her sister be her sister sometimes when she be hating on gay, gay people. But guess what? We may disagree about the status of gay people, which I don't, I don't get that part. But she also believes in democracy and she is standing on the side of democracy. We, I, if we don't vote the right way, we won't even be able to have policy debates. You do understand that, right? Oh, I don't agree with her, with, with um, the vice president's policies. We vote the wrong way and we don't do what's right by November 5th. You won't be debating policies because somebody's going to tell you what you're going to get, what you're going to have and how you're going to have to suck it up. And Micah Beckwith has already started by putting his Christian panel together. You see, Oklahoma has been ordering Bibles. I didn't see anybody ordering any Korans or any Torahs, but that's beside the point because, you know, separation of church and state. See, my, we are not telling people that they can't have religion or whether or not they should be gay. But Micah Beckwith is trying to pray our gay away. He doesn't believe that the divine did not make any mistakes and, and made us just the way we are. He doesn't believe that you should have a freedom of thought and be able to read the books that you want to read in public libraries. He is a chaos creator. And Mike Braun, he just don't even care. He didn't even bother to wear a tie to his debates. He didn't even bother to, sp I wore a tie to the post-debate analysis. If I can put on a tie, he can put on a tie. But apparently he didn't respect y'all enough to do that. He feels like he literally just showed up and acts like, all I got to do is stand here and breathe and y'all going to vote for me. Let's do the right thing. Let's protect democracy. And let's move America and Indiana forward. All right? That's my rant. That's all I got. Other than the fact that uh, Democrats... Uh, uh, Jennifer McCormick got $600,000 from the Democratic Governors Association. They believe in us. Y'all know that Democratic or national organizations very seldom give us money. Jennifer McCormick got six hundred grand to compete. And on October 13th, they're going to air on CBS 4 and Fox 59 at 9.30 a.m. the Attorney General debate between Destiny Wells and the worst Attorney General in the history of Attorney Generals, Ty Rakita. So check that out. It's going to be on In Focus October 13th at 9.30 a.m. They've already pre-recorded it, so you'll be able to check it out there. Again, we have a chance to change the direction of our nation and, and keep democracy in check. Uh, and let's hope you hope you see the rest of us uh, as humans as well. All right. Uh, let's run some ads, y'all. Today's show is brought to you by Bohm's Unique Boutique. Click on the QR code. And for all Turn Left listeners, you can get a 10% discount on your order by using the code DEMOCRAT. Be sure to visit www.bohmsuniqueboutique.com. Democrats, are you looking for an affordable digital content creation solution? Then look no further than Black Pearl IT Solutions and Black Pearl Studios. Indiana's own Dana Black is providing many of the communication wraparound services any Democratic organization needs. No matter the size of the budget, Indiana's own and Black Pearl Studios have you covered. Just scan the QR code or visit www.blackpearl-its.com. All right, all right. Well, this is the best part of the show right here. This is when we talk to the guests. You know, I get excited when, one, I get to see two ladies who are saying, nah, we not going to take this no more. We're going to step up and we're going to run. First up, my first time having either one of my guests on my show, and I'm super excited about it. Running in House District 71, 
Wendy Dent Chesser. Wendy, Hi. welcome to the show. Oh. Thank you, Dana. Very excited to be here this evening. I love it. And y'all, you know, I have a special place in my heart for District 88. You know, it's uh, it just does something to my insides. The fact that every Democratic candidate who has run for the seat since 2016 has been a woman. Y'all, running in House District 88, the love of my life, District 88, my girl, Stephanie Jo Yoakum. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Hey, Dana. Thanks for having me. Man, so, y'all, was there anything in my rant that resonated with you? Anything you want to mention? The, the, the book banning actually has come up a lot when I've been out canvassing neighborhoods, and I, I'm, I'm amazed but thrilled that people are saying no to that. Right? What about you, Steph? I, you know, everything that you said is like, you know, flashes of what my reality has been um, running against who I'm running against. Um, you know, Jeter has been the number one, one of the number one people to attack our transgender community and advocate for no exceptions to the abortion ban and just use uh, communities that are minding their own business as a tool and weapon um, for control. And you spoke so much to that. Um, and that is, that's just a reality um, for the person I'm running against. I'm glad you use that word control because that's what it's about. Right. It's not about helping people. I mean, y'all, what kind of human lies about the assistance people can get in the midst of a natural catastrophe? You know, I was thinking about that, too. So I grew up in Grant County, um, Marion, Indiana, and my father was a police officer there for a long time. And then he became the head of emergency management um, and was for a very long time. And, and I was talking to him about this. And he is, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but he's a Republican, um, a I. more old school, I guess, Republican, I would say. Um, and um, but what he but what he was saying to me is how dangerous all of this is, this narrative mm -hmm. of, of, of that nothing is happening because then people aren't taking advantage of those things like the $750 opportunity. Um, if this misinformation comes out, people aren't taking advantage of it and it, you're putting people in danger. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wendy, did you want to say something to that? Because those folks down there need our help and, you know. Well, what, what is, what is this, the, the, the culture of lying? What does that say to our kids? Um, as we as we talk about it, you know, I go back to the uh, my daughter was probably eight in 2016 for that election between um, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm trying to parent her and teach her the values that um, we think are norms in this community. But at what point do you get popular enough that you they don't apply to you? Yeah. It just it it doesn't make sense. I mean, and everybody at every level. I mean, the 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 thing that the thing I, I shouldn't actually ever mention anything she writes because it's obvious that she's a idiot. But uh, M MTG Marjorie Taylor Greene said that the government had was manipulating the hurricane to hit you know to miss the the Democratic areas of Florida, um, but at the same time they say that climate change is not man-made can, can y'all help me make this make sense how, how do you deny climate change is happening but say that we can control a weather event yes yes I have no idea. Um, again the, the science doesn't matter thinking is is no longer being encouraged for people to think on their own and yet we can um if we say it loud enough it becomes the truth. And, and that is, that is not, it's not the way that I was brought up. I'm proud to be back home in my home area of Jeffersonville and in district 71. I know that's not the way we were brought up. Absolutely. Y'all yeah. that's, that, there's a lot of stuff going on in the nation, but let's turn it back to y'all. Wendy, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the first time, like, I don't even know nothing. Like, I know that you won a, 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 a caucus um, and, you know, Dr. Fleming, you know, she was able to get a lot of positive legislation when it comes to health care. Um, some things, 
you know, we don't always agree on, but she was able to get some some stuff passed. She decided to ret- retire, resign. You were caucused in, and now you are running in that seat, which is, is, is a held seat, so we got to hang on to it. Tell yeah. people who you are and where you come from. Happy to. Um, spent uh, grew, grew up in, in, in Jeffersonville, went to Indiana University Southeast over here in New Albany, and um, left it, uh, when I after college. And one of the jobs I had during that time is I spent about eight years uh, working for the O'Bannon Kernan administration. Mm-hmm. The last time we've had a Democratic administration, and I worked in both agriculture and economic development, which was the Department of Commerce. And in seeing what the state needed at the time, um, the rural areas were different. They had different needs than the more urban areas. Mm -hmm. But yet we all cared about one another and we were able to come forward with plans that benefited everybody. And it was the the absolute highlight of my career to be a part of that administration. Um, After after um, the the 2000. in five in four election, I went to Southwest Michigan and I did economic development mm-hmm. in the communities of Benton Harbor St. Joe and St. Joseph. Very unique experience for me, um, but it, it, it taught me a lot about the community development side. What do people really need? Is it housing? Is it food? Is it transportation? Is it child care? All of those things. So when I came back to my home area in 2012 to run One Southern Indiana, which is the Chamber of Commerce for Clark and Floyd counties, um, it was very natural that while we talked about the needs that businesses had, we recognized that behind every business is people. Mm -hmm. And if you can help a business and find ways to help the people of that business, or even the people who live in the area who can achieve their own opportunities through that business, that's what I spent the majority of my career working on. And it was great to be able to come back to Southern Indiana and and be in that position for 11 years where I was able to really make a difference for the folks who lived here. The difference was at the time, they didn't know who I was. I'm on, I'm on the facilitation side, making sure that we're selling the community, we're figuring out what people need, and then the business take takes over. Now, as I'm putting my name out there, it's um, been fun to tell the story, especially when we're out canvassing neighbor in the neighborhoods and finding out what people work and say, well, when that company came to town in 2015, here was the, some of the, the, the promises and conditions that they were looking for. How are they treating you as an employee? And those are great conversations to have. Oh my goodness. Wow. My head just exploded. I love to hear that. I love Okay. So was there something in your youth? Because even as, you know, doing the economic development and working for the chamber, um, was there something in your youth and your upbringing that said, I'm a, being a public servant? Because you could have took those skills and went and worked for a private organization making, you know, a whole guy. I'm not saying, I don't know what you make, but I'm just saying you, private sector always make more than public sector. Uh, talk about what was what was going on in your household as a young person that that, that lets you see um, that, that being a servant uh, leader was, a, a way, a path to go for you? Great question. Um, a couple of things. Being first generation college graduate was um, something that both of my parents were proud of. Um, and while they knew that things, they knew what they liked about the community. So we drive down the street and mom would say, oh, I love what they're doing there. Or I hate what they're doing there. And I'd always ask her, mom, who's they? Mm. Who are the people that are making the decisions? And we started to have those conversations. And then I realized, you know, when I grew up a little bit, I was like, oh, gosh, I'm one of the they. I'm they. Oh. I have to take care of those uh, those people who have an opinion on these things because this is where they call, this is the place that they call home. Um, so you know, mom was also very active. Um, single mom kept us out in, you know, kept us out of trouble mm-hmm. by making us volunteer all the time. And as, um, as I recognize what value she instilled in me, um, whether or not she had public service in my future, I, I don't know, but I um, I recognize that that it's something that is innate to me so I can take it forward. One of the things you mentioned um, in, in telling us your story was that you would go out and talk to the community and then take that back to the businesses. When you ha- saw a conflict, 
between mm-hmm. what was right for the community and what the business wanted. And I'm not going to tell you, you know, ask me to give any examples, but how did you like resolve that? What was your method for, you know, because we, we need both, right? We, we have to take care our, of the people. They work so, and be, get their stuff. It, you know, it, it's difficult because um, the, the, the businesses often have the, con- the, the control, but if they're, um, a lot of times it's not it's not a malicious thing that a business does. It's it's they're unaware. Um, they have management changes themselves. So they don't know what the situation was when they when they came to town or what the community asked or expected of them. Mm-hmm. So the big key, Dana, is is to communicate to them. Here's what was done, here's what was said, here's where we are. We have a little bit of an impasse, or we, we have a difference. Let's not make it an impasse. Let's figure out how we communicate, collaborate, and get things done. And um, that's why another reason I feel very confident that moving into the role of state representative, I can follow in Dr. Fleming's footsteps. Steve Simler was in this position before her. Very, um, very adept, both of them very adept at getting things done on behalf of District 71 because they knew how to talk to people and explain what the, what the needs are for the people who live here. Man, I, I'm excited about uh, continuing this conversation. Stephanie, tell the people who you are and where you come from. Well, sure. Um, Wendy, it's so nice to meet you and <laughs> learn, learn so much about you. I was just sitting there thinking about community communication and collaboration and the lack thereof at the State House and Man. just thinking like, wouldn't it be amazing to bring those values there? Um, yeah, so I'm Stephanie Yoakum, uh, Stephanie Joe Yoakum. I am from Grant County, like I said, Marion, Indiana. Um, I uh, always tell people I have four parents. My parents divorced and remarried at a young age, but I'm one of those really lucky ones where all four of them um, decided to learn how to get along. And and now, uh, oh gosh, 40 some years later, um, I think they talk to each other sometimes more than I talk to them. <laughs> Um, my father was a police officer, like I said, my mother was a middle school teacher and my stepfather was a middle school school counselor. Um, and my stepmom was on every board you can possibly think of. Uh, so public service was, uh, ingrained in me pretty early, understanding what's happening in community, what the needs of people are, um, was something that was normal dinner table conversation. Mm. I feel like I was really lucky, um, for that. Um, I went to college in Southern Indiana, Hanover College, um, have some family down in that area, not far from, from UND. Um, and then after that, I joined the AmeriCorps um, to uh, figure out what my next steps were going to be. And, and frankly, I actually was going to do a gap year and go back to school, get my graduate degree and become an a anthropologist or something like that. My undergrad degree is in anthropology. Um, but as soon as I started that work, I, um, knew that, that my path was, was going to be different than what I had planned. So I, uh, did a couple years of the AmeriCorps working with, uh, high school students, uh, in, um, urban areas. Um, and the goal of the program that, uh, that I helped run was to bring high school students together from different high schools. And if you went to any high school, you know that there are rival high schools anywhere you live, right? Um, and we were in San Jose, California, bringing together high school kids from all over the place with the goal of helping them find commonality. And it was such an incredible experience for me that it changed the trajectory of my, my career. And so for the last 20 plus years, I've been working in nonprofit, um, still pretty tied to the AmeriCorps in different ways. I serve as the chair of the Indiana State Commission on uh, Service and Volunteerism, so support the um, d- dollars that go out into the communities uh, through AmeriCorps. Um, and I currently um, am the vice president of operations for a large education nonprofit that uses play and physical activity as a means for for social emotional learning, which I've been told we're not supposed to use those kind of words in our state anymore. And I'm not going to stop because they're super important for the development of our children. So um, I did Hoosier Women Forward a couple Yay, of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I did it because I knew I wanted to get more engaged, um, but I didn't know how. I watched my mom volunteer on the Obama campaign. She was one of the reasons why Grant County turned blue in that first election. And um, 
I've, I've seen her example of what it looks like to engage and she still um, is texting. She's at home writing postcards for me right now um, and texting for the presidential campaign. And I didn't know how I wanted to get engaged, but I knew I wanted to. And um, I thought I was going to be behind the scenes. And yet again, <laughs> what I thought was going to be true <laughs> did not turn out to be the case. Um, and here I am um, stepping up when um, I think our district just needs it. Our district, it's time. Our district ha- is changing dramatically. Hancock County and McCordsville is one of the fastest growing yes. areas. In the, state. the diversity is growing. Um, the vibrancy of this community is just expanding. And it's just really exciting out here. Um, and you know, I'm in this to win it. So, uh, no matter, no matter what it takes, no matter how long it takes. Definitely. Um, if I could, I'd vote for you. <laughs> That's, Thanks, you Wendy. <laughs> you've got the, you've got an amazing background. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Both yeah. Of y'all do. And what's so crazy is like, both of y'all are smarter than pretty much. <clears throat> okay. I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm gonna leave it alone. Cause there are dumb people in Congress. I'm just saying, I know y'all running for the state house, but I'm, she said that we could control the government could control the hurricane y'all. Anyway, you know, you mentioned that you have a unique blended family. We're seeing that conversation come up a lot because our vice president has not given birth to children, um, mm-hmm. but she has children. Um, and but but what I think that conversation speaks to is that certain people believe that a family should look a certain way. Talk about how um, how you have benefited from having, you know, a very unique blended family. Do you have any siblings? You know what what comes from all of that from having you know a very unique family. Um, well, first of all, I have four incredible parents, humans, friends, and I could not imagine my life without, uh, I, I don't even like the word step parents. I mean, they mm-hmm. are, mm-hmm. they are, um, Alan and Nancy are just like two of the best humans you'll ever meet in your life. And I couldn't imagine my life without their influence, without their influence on my mom and dad and the happiness that they brought to them and how that impacted my life. Um, So I think that's a big deal. Like, I don't know who I would have been or where I would be if I didn't, if this, if I didn't get this blended family. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when there are attacks on families, I I take that a little personally, but also because I also have a family um, that's multicultural. Mm -hmm. um, And so that is upsetting to me when I see attacks on people of color. Um, I have family and friends, families, are they called? Mm -hmm. Friends that I choose as my family, uh, who choose uh, to love somebody who looks different than my, you know, who I might choose to love. And it's just, to me, all very personal attacks. Um, And to your point of what you said earlier, like, leave people alone. Like, when did the Democrats become the small government party? Like, when did we become the ones that are like, just mind mind your damn business? Ain't that what Coach said? Mind your damn business. They don't want to do that. But I just love this, you know, the the dynamic of, you know, the AmeriCorps. I mean, because, again, you could have, you know, taken your... Now, I don't know how much money you was going to make with your anthropology degree, but (laughs) (laughs) you could have been off somewhere digging up some people. (laughs) Who knows? Who knows? I might have made more than I did in nonprofit and certainly more as uh, an AmeriCorps member, but... Uh, I, now I get to support AmeriCorps all over the country, um, and in our state. And it feels like such a full circle moment for me to do that. Um, and to help other young people get engaged with their communities, um, and in the civic process. So, oh my gosh, guys, guys, do you hear how amazing these candidates are? Like if you're not, if you're like me, you probably real geeked right now. So what I want you to do is click the donate link. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know it's it's a, a month away. We're already starting early voting, but there's always something that they will need at the last minute or water for their um, door knockers or food for their phone bankers, whatever it is. Could you please click the donate link so that you can donate to these amazing candidates who are ready to represent you, who are incredibly intelligent and just want to mind their own damn business. <laughs> All right, guys, let's let's get into it. <clears throat> my apologies for the coffin. You know, the, the state house, uh, in my opinion, um, is, is, is the most powerful place in my, in our citizen government. Um, the state house can determine, uh, what bills come down 
Am I from the federal government? And then uh, how heavy handed they choose to be on local government? Because there used to be a time when the GOP used to think, you know, home rule was a thing. But they don't believe that if you are uh, uh, Indianapolis or Lake County. I just, you know, that's where the, you know, the minorities live. So um, when you see the different pieces of legislation that are coming out of the state house, tell me one piece that you saw, you know, no matter how recent or uh, how long ago that really got your craw and you said, you know what, if I ever get in the state house, uh, when do y'all start with you? Um, so w- running the, running a, a local chamber of commerce, one of the, one of the functions that we did was to have an advocacy committee and look at legislation as it came down. And there were, we, we would play offense as, but we would probably play defense more often than we would play offense because, as I'm finding out that most people come to the state house with, um, you know, nobody knows a, a lot about everything. Right. So we have to figure out what it is that they're where they're coming from and what they're looking for. Um, you know, one of my areas of of experience is economic development. How do you bring businesses to your community and help them thrive there? And there were often bills that would come down that were not um, friendly for Indiana businesses to want to grow, expand, mm. or even stay open here. So those are the, the the ones that we looked at. Some of them were just silly. Um, some and, and you could tell somebody got mad at somebody in their home area and they thought, well, this is a you know, because of this, these people will shut this down. Sorry. But there wasn't um, you know, there's a lot of little examples like that. Mm-hmm. Um I think the ones, though, that that are probably stuck in my memory, though, are the ones that we got across the finish line. We put we put an offensive uh, we put the off offense in place and we said, you know, this is important to us. And while this may not make sense to those in central Indiana, for those of us in the border communities that, you know, I, I just sound like Sarah Palin. I can look across my backyard. No, and don't see, say that. You know, don't. You know, no, like, it's like can... Beetlejuice. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see Kentucky out in my backyard. I mean, so, so, something like that. And I can't say that those are that that's not a, a positive influence on our economy here. Louisville, Kentucky is, you know, in Southern Indiana, we're best known for a city we're not in a yeah. state we're not a part of. So we have to find ways to play in this region that right. that is is best for our citizens. We work, you know, we have people who work there. They have people who work here. We have, um, uh, I don't have to build a zoo in Sellersburg. I got the Louisville Zoo right. and it's, you know, it's 20, 20 minutes away. But one of the, one of the, um, the real issues that came up was a um, our, our hospital systems are very connected, mm. both in Jeffersonville and New Albany. The hospitals have been purchased by Louisville Hospital Systems, and, and an Indiana uh, hospital at, at the time did not recognize the license of a Kentucky nurse. And what that was doing was creating a healthcare challenge that our residents and the businesses here were, were, were saying, this is a problem. So we worked bipartisan, unilaterally with folks around different parts of the state. And Indi- Indiana is now a member of the Interstate Nursing Compact, which means that our states recognize to a point the licenses offered by other states. Nice. As a Hoosier, that benefits me. Yeah. Now, it, and, and there are telehealth reasons it benefits people in Indianapolis yeah. and throughout the state. So when we understand and get behind and can really play offense on getting the right thing done and celebrate that success, those are the reasons that, that those are the things I look forward to being being in the middle of as well. Oh, my God. It sounds like you're already better than most of the legislators in there. Stephanie, <laughs> what about you? Anything that's got you craw? I mean, I really appreciate what you said, Wendy, that, you know, folks bring different expertise to the table. And um, I think one of the things that makes my skin crawl is the lack of expertise and education Mm. in the state house. I think we have one sitting teacher on the Democratic side, Tanya Paff, right now. Uh, Well, no, um, no, don't forget uh, Dr. Um, Smith. Mm, Right. That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, Dr. Smith. 
Dr. Smith, that's right. Um, but we have very few educators sitting in the state house. And oftentimes we see the right side of the state house not actually ask educators for their input um, or their um, their um, expertise. And I know I was talking to Senator Henley about this one specific bill who you know, was a classroom teacher and then a principal. And that is the bill they passed to hold back third graders um, who didn't pass the iRead test, which just makes my skin crawl mm. um and it makes us crawl for a few reasons one is because um there's so much data that shows when you hold a child back um they are more susceptible to bullying their chances of graduating high school plummet mm. um there are so many reasons um against holding a child back unless absolutely necessary but the the biggest reason why it makes my skin crawl is because we are punishing children for our state's lack of preparation of those Oops. children, right? And so if we have kindergarten and pre-K for those kids, those kids could be ready to read by third grade, but we don't have enough pre-K seats. We don't have universal pre-K. We need it desperately. Kindergarten is not required. And so I see kids um, when I'm working with schools start school in first grade. Oh. And in first grade, now they're just learning how to line up. They're learning how to listen. They're learning how to learn. And so of course by third grade, they're gonna be behind. Yeah. Um, and so that bill just absolutely makes my skin crawl because we are actually punishing kids for our failures in the first place. Um, you, you and know, so let's stick, with, let's stick with education because you know, you you know, I feel like I'm, I'm talking about it every show, but doggone it. If we had better education, maybe people wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't fall victim. So many millions fall victim to the orange narcissist. Oh. You know, one of the, you talked about, you know, they changed, you know, to hold back third graders. And this is, this question is for both of you. They, they tend to change what they're doing before they even see what they changed last time even works. Mm -hmm. Talk about what you guys and, and I don't care who goes first. Talk about your take on education and, and what you plan to bring to that discussion. I'll start, Stephanie, um, and um, jump in at any time. But I think a couple of things. Number one, when you talk about a workforce system, it starts with the education system and what we hope students in the education system are, are, are learning is how to learn, how to unlearn, mm -hmm. and then how to relearn. Because what they're going to do to support themselves, they have to, they also have to learn to earn because we want people sure. to be self-sufficient. And that's where they, they can find fulfillment if they're, if they're managing and, and, and being self, self-fulfilled, self-actualization, if you go to Maslow's hierarchy. Um, so, so the education system is preparing students to think and learn and have a little bit of fun while they're doing it. Um, I'm happy to be, I have been spent most of my time, in, I was caucused in, in June, at the end of May, sworn in in June, and I've spent a lot of time with teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm amazed every day. I went to public schools. My daughter goes to public schools. We know that they are constantly seeing changes in diplomas. Mm -hmm. and we're, we're going to throw another one at them. We know that, um, that funding is an issue. Um, it's not just you can throw money at, at the schools and all of the problems disappear. You got to direct it. You got to make sure it's managed and it's understood what that funding is for. Instead, we work. We, we now have vouchers that mm. is taking money off the top of the public mm. or what would be going to the public schools. And you have a situation where um, the teachers have less say through their union on what mm. they can what they can accomplish. And so I, I just see us going backwards mm -hmm. and um, the education, the public education system is too important. It's important to us as individuals. It's important to the businesses that are here because they need people who are going to be able to fill their workforce pipeline. And they need people who are going to learn how to, th who, who know how to think. <sighs> and we are, we're doing a lot of things that I think are, are counterproductive to our students yeah. and that's going to really hurt us maybe not tomorrow but in 10 years when those students are in the workforce we know we're going to have it i know i believe 
fully, we're going to have a challenge if we're not all focused on supporting public education to the best of our ability. Love, love that answer. Talk to us, Stephanie. Um, I, I mean, yes, <laughs> right? double tap everything um, you just said, Wendy. I think um, as somebody who works in the social emotional space, um, this this dismissal of um, realizing that kids need to learn to learn, mm -hmm. like you're talking about, Wendy, is is really concerning to me. Um, I think that everyone's bought in on, and I love the way you put that, learn to earn. Um, I think people are bought into that, but but for some reason, we're dismissing this idea that um, that critical thinking is good. In fact, critical thinking apparently has become a bad uh, phrase yeah. to you. Um, and, um, and so those are... It, to me, it's parallel to other disinformation, right? Like you don't need that, you don't need this, you don't need this, just just this, you know, just learn to earn. And I'm afraid we're just going to create a population of sort of busy bee workers who will be ready to work for the next 10 years. But what about the next 10 years after that, when mm -hmm. everything changes dramatically, when technology changes, yeah, yeah. when earth changes more, um, and they won't have the capacity or ability to learn how to learn something else, right? Yeah. Um, and that's literally so, what happened in a, with Carrier when, oh. <laughs> excuse me, when in, tw remember 2016, Carrier was leaving and the orange menace lied and said, I will save your jobs if you vote for me. And then they moved anyway. We didn't have a plan in place for those folks who lost their jobs. What was their plan right. to, to retool them? Yeah, the, the statistics show that, that entry level jobs are the ones that change most rapidly. Mm -hmm. And some of them change into more technology based. Some of them change direction. Some of them go away. And until we are, we're truly giving folks the ability to, to choose a pathway and, and we're working with our, our school system here and have been on helping kids see the application of what they're learning. Why do I have to learn fractions? Well, if you're in construction, this is a fraction, this is how fraction is fractions right. are used. Or if you're if you're in biomed or engineering or public safety, whichever, whatever choice you have, give the students an opportunity to to see that um, in action and that's that uh, that it'll inspire them. But the first proposal that the Department of Education gave on the, the, the graduation requirements, in my opinion, and I was very vocal about it, took it way too far. It was requiring every student to get, uh, every junior and senior to get workplace learning experience. And that's not practical. No. 16, 17 year olds, their brains think differently. Yeah. Businesses aren't educated and trained in education. So you, they come into the workforce and, and then, you know, are they, are they value, is there value in that time? There was, there was really a lot of expectation that our businesses were going to do that. And I, I've worked with businesses my entire career. Most of them aren't prepared for that. And most of them have opportunities to engage in schools. They're not, but, but it's, it's hard to find those pathways. Well, and, I never and Jennifer McCormick brought up something incredibly uh, interesting when I interviewed her on turn left. She said it was just a, 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 a way to skirt labor laws. Like all they wanted to do was just take these kids and give them the low wage jobs. Like, I mean, 14 year olds working to nine o'clock. So, the, so a couple of, I, I, there are, are some great examples. We have a, a, a hospital here who has a three-year apprenticeship program. So juniors in high school are entering into this program and they'll stay, they'll be employed and they'll have an employment for a year after college. And then they will, or excuse me, after high school, and they will end with an apprenticeship in an area that they choose. That's wonderful. Yeah. They have 10 students that are selected for that type process. It's great. I never want to inhibit that type sure. of um, creativity. But to expect every student to be able to to do that, and for that means a lot of them. I mean, let's let's be honest. They're going to work fast food. They're going to work in something yes. that is not going to necessarily, and, and they may or may not get paid for it if they need the credit. So we have to make sure that we're doing something that's fair and equitable to all students who are at different ambition levels, different edu different achievement levels. 
because they have to find their footing and we can't afford to fail any of them. And Stephanie, it's safe. Go, who's going to keep them safe? Uh, that, that's, see, that's Stephanie, I was going to go there. Two things for you. One, you, you, I know you both have um, a lot of rural areas, but, but Stephanie, um, if you're 16 and not quite have your driver's license and you're a junior and you have this work requirement, you live in rural Indiana, how are you getting there? I have no idea. And also, how are you going to guarantee that you're going to keep my kid safe? Right. Yeah. We, we know that there are instances of, you know, all kinds of things in workplaces mm -hmm. amongst adults. And then you're, we want to put a minor in those situations. And sometimes the only minor in that situation. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, the, the, it didn't even feel, feel well thought out. There are an incredible amount of examples, like the one you gave Wendy that are, that, that help kids get to the next path. The other thing I think about is I thought I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I learned very quickly, I didn't. And luckily I had an education that was broad enough that I didn't actually have to go back to school to learn how to look at a budget. Like anthropologists don't look at a lot of budgets. I mean, probably <laughs> a little bit, but not the way I have to in an operation position. And, but because of my broad education, I already had a little bit of background and a little bit of everything, right? And I get so concerned that when we narrow the focus for our students, that we take away some potential opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. I love the opportunity that they can do this apprenticeship through this hospital, but do they also have the background that at some point in time they decide they want to go to college, that they can then pivot and do that as well. And to me, that is super important to keep their choices open for them as well. I, I Dana, I hope well, I hope your your listeners are following the, the second proposal for the graduation requirements was much much more reasonable. Dr. Jenner listened to several of us, but it doesn't answer all of the concerns. So they're in the process of uh, developing the rules for what the the second proposals of diplomas are coming uh, will be, and then they're going to have a public comment period. Mm -hmm. My concern here, we are sitting on October 10th, and this by by statute has to be finalized and approved by the Department of uh, Education by the end of December. Mm. So we're coming up, by, we're, we've got just over, or, or excuse me, less than two months to really dig into this with a couple holidays thrown in. I, we're, we need to let everybody know when these rules are issued and there is an open public comment period, we have to make sure that parents, educators, employers, that we all have the op opportunity and, and take that opportunity to have our voices heard. Oh, on child, I'm pretty sure that meeting will be at 10 a.m. somewhere. <laughs> then we'll be um, there. I, I, I will say, there. to me, this was an example of people showing up and, mm -hmm. and making their voice yeah. heard. I mean, the amount of feedback, both online and in person, that was provided, um, you know, I, I think people are ready to be heard and I hope we see that in the election. Um, but I was, I, you know, even though I was upset about that first proposal, I was, I was very excited about the energy people had to make sure their voices were heard. I love yeah. that. Let's, let's pivot a little bit. Cause I, I end up talking about education way too long and it's an hour long show, but, the, but, but honestly, if you don't educate people, everything else falls by the wayside, the type of healthcare they're going to get falls by the wayside there where they can live falls by the wayside. Their children's education then falls by the wayside. If we don't take care, that's why it's so important. But I want to talk about something that, uh, Bron, Bron dropped his, <clears throat> his public safety uh, plan. I'm not going to go into details about it. You guys can Google that. Um, but it's interesting how, you know, Republicans only care about, you know, police officers when they're not trying to overthrow the fair election. Okay. Let's just be clear. But public safety, it, it's, you know, there's, there's reality and perception, right? <laughs> the reality is crime is going down. All levels of crime are, are going down. Um, yes, there was a spike um, at, at the end of COVID for multiple reasons. Desp desperation make people do desperate things. But crime is coming down. Um, and there is this notion that Democrats, um, we, don't, we don't care about law enforcement. Hello, there are Democrats in law enforcement, but people are dumb and they're, they, I shouldn't say that. My mother told me it's, some people just don't look, think, you know, broadly about things. Right. I, public safety is going to be at, at every conversation you find yourself in. When, or I'm going to start with Stephanie this time. 
Talk about how you see public safety and um, the role that that you want to play in helping to craft public safety that that addresses all the issues and needs. Especially, and the reason why I ask y'all this is because one, you got a business person, business and community development minded person, and you're you know uh, AmeriCorps. You're trying to develop young minds that they're doing great things. So public safety hits it right for both of y'all. Yeah. Well. Um... Public safety hits me in the heart. Uh, my dad was a police officer my entire life. Yep. And I know what it feels like to have your um, parent or your loved one uh, be in that line of work. And in fact, when he retired, I made him give me his badge and it's set in wood upstairs in my in my room. So we can't have it back. Um, you know, wh- one thing I've learned um, recently that, I, that was new to me, and, and maybe this is my own naivety, was that um, public safety officers don't always have a seat at the table when their uh, livelihood, when um, their jobs are uh, being discussed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was talking to a, um, a person in public safety, and um, they were explaining to me a situation um, at the state house uh, that was happening, and they really thought that somebody um, from their department should have been at the table. And they asked, and they asked, and they didn't get the opportunity. And I thought, in my head, that was shocking. Mm-hmm. Um, again, my, my naiveness um, here, because I thought, wow, if if I'm making decisions about police, fire, any kind of public safety. I am a nonprofit executive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What do I know? Shouldn't I be sitting down with the folks who are impacted by that work every day? Um, And so to me, um, what I want to bring to the table is the same thing I would bring for educators, for whomever, is that is um, a humility to know that just because I sit in a seat at the state house doesn't mean I know everything Mm -hmm. um, and that it is my job to listen and you know, not control. It is my job to um, work collaboratively. To mm-hmm. go back to Wendy's uh, word from the beginning, um, and not um, decide what I think is best. Um, I think that's that's the the main thing. I think the other thing too is that um, I I really believe that we have to work on um, the relationship between the community and public safety. Um, and we have to make sure that, um, folks are held accountable across all boards. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think those are hard conversations and people don't want to have them because they're hard conversations, but I think it's our responsibility to have hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's the other thing that I'm not, I won't shy away from. I don't shy away from hard conversations. You work from, talk to anybody I work with. Um, they don't always love it because I'll bring it right up. Um, but I think it's really important. And we're talking about people's lives here. I, I uh, love that. And the fact that you mentioned that people, um, they don't, they don't have a seat at the table, even when they are, they didn't listen. Like literally right. they were like, uh, sorry, your constitutional carry is terrible. Could you not do that? And they were like, nope, nope, no permit needed. That's right. That's right. You know, yeah. so even when they were there, they didn't listen. Like, that's right. Ugh. Wendy, my my dad was like took away such an important tool yes. for us to take away permitless carry. What? How do we know? Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking like, why? Why would you do that to this 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 our public safety officers? And Wild. see, for me, it was always you know if you pull me over, you don't know if I have a gun or not. And as someone who fits the description with with the panicky chicken shit police officers, mm-hmm. I am I am target practice. <laughs> Because they don't know. I didn't know if she had a gun or not. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't. I, you know, I, so I, I, I so think much about, layers of danger. Yeah. Yeah. I think about as as a, as how many black and brown lives are going to be lost because the police officers who's already a chicken and shouldn't really be in uniform anyway is going to be like, oh, I didn't know if they had a gun or not. So I was in fear of my life. Mm. Wendy, talk about public safety. So a, cu- a couple things on the personal level. Um, you know, my 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 daughter does not look like me, um, and. I have had to go to friends who are of color and ask, can you talk to her about how when she is driving, she will be, if she gets pulled over, what she needs to do? Because my way of doing it, I've never ever felt like my life was in danger if I got pulled over. I don't, you know, she's she's 5'11", she's beautiful, but she could 
potentially walk into and she's also a smart aleck she could walk into something or, or or get faced with something and she doesn't know how to get out of it so i think those are it's a very real conversation as a as a mom in a personal mm -hmm. level as a as a community um you said that we're we're, we're rural communities and in my district is probably one of the more urban districts yeah. in south central indiana with jeffersonville clarksville and a bit of yeah. new Albany. So we do have, with Louisville right across the river, we do have a lot of those those urban crimes that are committed, theft, mm -hmm. ring, you know, rings, and, and it's important for our businesses. I go back to you know what I know. It's important for our businesses to have a good relationship with um, with our our public safety officers. One of the biggest challenges that the, the police chiefs, as well as the fire chiefs, have shared with me is recruiting talent. Mm. They too are struggling with some of these workforce challenges and they want the best of the best. We want them to hire the best of the best. And so things like protecting the pension fund, the the, mm. the 77 pension fund that both of those, um, uh, both police and fire work pay, pay into. Those are things that when we get folks who are thinking about longevity of their careers, they're going to take it seriously mm -hmm. because they want to make sure that they're doing the best, getting the best people so that we can make, we can tell our citizens, we, not, we, we have not only good services, but the best services. So those are going to be important to us. Well, you know, it's interesting before I, you, what's interesting, you know, being down there, um, it, 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 by Louisville, um, you, I imagine, I imagine the last couple of years have been, uh, oof, a little uh -huh. different, especially, you know, if you have a, a, a brown child uh -huh. uh, and it don't even they don't have to see them. You could be sleeping in your bed and they take you out. Um, uh, but you also but, are thinking about the, the growth of the community and, and protecting the community. Again, you find yourself walking that fine line and but you were going to say something else. I'm sorry. I just had to just bring that because you, you just. So, no, I'm. I'm I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that. You you brought it back to that because, um, you know, the, again, Brianna I, Taylor I have, yeah, yeah Brian, Brian, Brianna Taylor. We, you know, my daughter and I had conversations. Here's what ha What did she do? Well, she got out of bed in the middle of the night because somebody was was you know beating her door down. And and when you have that conversation with a with a young kid, it it scares her. And I don't mean to scare her unfairly, but she has to know that the world is not as safe for her as it as we as mo at least as mom would like it for it to be uh, i love that and and both of you are you know you know you as white women mm -hmm. you know um you're you're typically characterized in our american societies as damsels in distress and you are to be protected and you're waiting for your knight on the white horse right i i, I get that but having oh. um members of your family who are not in that demographic mm -hmm. um do do you believe that it ultimately contributes um to your political philosophy because it's not just how you see it it is mm -hmm. about how others see it too stephanie mm -hmm. absolutely a thousand percent i think um one of the best decisions i ever made after college is moving to California and spending 10 years there um, and experiencing cultures that don't even exist in that level, like that, uh, that big um, here or didn't at the time and being exposed to so much diversity changed my, um, the way I operate at a very young age. And I st still had a lot and still do have a lot to learn mm -hmm. and unlearn. Um, and then coming back here and being part of this community, doing the work I do in schools um, with my staff all across the country, you know, the reality for me is that Indiana as a state and the folks, the state house are still very much representing one cohort of people. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is, Dana, if um, the state house stays red, um, if the country stays red, that might not be true. Let's stick with the state house. If the state house stays red, I will probably be okay, right? I'm a middle-class white woman, white husband, white child. We will probably be okay. That is not true for everyone. And I see it as my responsibility as just a member of the community to use my voice and whatever else I might have 
to raise that up because in, in, in my vision, if some are not okay, then all are not mm. okay. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it is probably what drives me the most. I mean, my, my opponent, like I said, I started at the beginning, I feel like uses marginalized communities to weaponize uh, as a weapon to, mm. to keep folks from looking at the real issues, mm. to infuriate and bubble up his base. I mean, if you look at his social media most recently, he's talking about the transgender uh, sports ban and that. how he can't wait to get back to session. And he hopes that we, we bring that back up and we make it mm. even stronger. And I think like, you're- For the one we- kid? They wanted to play in all of the six million. That's right. Yeah. And we've got other huge issues. We have fraud and Medicaid and 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 children with disabilities whose families don't have the resources they need because right? likely that fraud. Because right? they lost seven hundred and fifty million dollars. And they won't even right. go and get that. But they but that one trans kid that might want to play basketball. Okay. Yeah, we, the, the priorities of what's really important to most Hoosiers is d- not d- discussed and debated to the level, to the extent to when it could. Um, you go back to SB1 when Ugh. when the state rushed in to make that decision. We had real problems that affected a lot of people in the state. Nobody was rushing in and calling a se- special session to address those issues. And so we have to get our priorities back on track with what most Hoosiers really feel are the things that are important. It's not which books to ban. It's not who to keep uh, to keep marginalized. Instead, it's how do we make those incremental changes so that all of us can find the opportunities and pursue those opportunities that we hope for. That's what makes us happy. Yeah. And that's what makes Indiana successful. Yeah. And so shame on us for not forgetting our priorities on and it. And to black. live without fear. I feel like to me, ooh. that's the last thing is everyone should get to live without fear. Ooh, and see, ooh, I'm so glad you said that because literally that's all they're using to intimidate people. So I made, mm-hmm. a, I, mm, I made a post about um, our get out the vote rally, <laughs> excuse me. And I, uh, I used uh, Facebook uh, to advertise it. So I, I paid to get it out to a 25 mile radius. So people want to come to Marion County and, and get out the vote. And the hate from people who would never come to the event and the, the nonsense they spew. But like, I'm like, bro, you think I'm scared of you? Like, I'm a survivor. I'm a descendant of the survivors of the Middle Passage. We lasted through 400 years of slavery, another 100 years of Jim Crow. We were, well, I, you think you scared me behind a keyboard? But I also know that I don't have children. My parents are gone and I don't have a legal spouse who actually lives with me. So I can be a little bit more out there without fear of something happening to my people. But the, the, the thing of it is, is like, I go to these counties and I talk to these folks and they are scared to be Democrats in their own community. And I'm like, y'all gotta stop that. Like, if I if I can show up in your community and I increase increase the minority population by 100 percent and come talk to y'all, then you can go talk to your neighbor. Y'all may not agree, but I know y'all can find common ground because y'all live in the same community. Like, ooh, I'm sorry, did I just? My bad. I got on my well, soapbox for just a minute there. Now, the, 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 Dana, I, yeah, your your strength and and uh, um, fortitude of resolve to say I'm going to talk about what's not right. We all need to do that. And you said in your rant at the beginning, you need allies and we need we need allies to do the right thing. And we can band together. And I don't know who coined this phrase, but I I, I love it. Indiana is in a red state. We're purple with the turnout. Destiny problem. Wells, who's Destiny running Wells. for a turnout? Okay, thank you. I couldn't, I don't, I I didn't want to Great miss a plug. Look at you plugging our candidates. I love but that. But that's how, but it was it's so true. And especially in, in in this district where people of color have not been voting at the levels that it, right. you can look at the voting precincts and see in the last presidential election, which ones had the, you know, just at 50 percent of the eligible vote, voters showed up. Somebody's we're not ta- we're not in we're not embracing that vision that they have or at least helping empower that voice we know that they have and we have to we have to find an uh, opportunity for them to use it 
Yeah, I think the one thing too that we have been fighting against in our district is the um, narrative that I feel like the Republicans have been very successful at, that we are a red state, right? Destiny is absolutely right. We're not, if you really look at the data, but it has been successfully driven into people's brains that we are. And so folks feel disenfranchised. And so, so much of what I do at Doors is talk to folks and be like, uh, no, you're not the only one. You got about 10 on your street. You might want to start talking to your neighbors a little bit more. Or you might want to put out a sign so that somebody else will be like, oh, hold on a second. Um, and I think we're just going to have to do more of that. I keep telling everyone, pick one thing that you can do every day. One thing. I don't care if it's make 10 calls. I don't care if it's write five postcards. I don't care if it's just go talk to your neighbors as your one thing. But we have got to start talking more and, and really um, dispelling this myth that there are no Democrats or for that matter, just folks who want more balance and more common sense and less chaos oh, um, at our state house. Yeah. And you know what? I also try to find people's pain points. And then I, I point to a policy that is creating that pain point. Right. Because see, that's that's people want people. They want people to solve problems. Mm -hmm. They want folks to solve problems, not create problems. Like, you know, <laughs> you listen to the debate between Rainwater, uh, McCormick, and Braun, and Rainwater wants to essentially eliminate uh, 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 state taxes and without without thinking about the repercussion to local government and what that looks like. Like, bro, you, you think it's cool just to sit around and smoke weed and not pay taxes, but you're not putting a snowplow on your Tesla. Mm -hmm. You don't have a garbage truck on a, that you pull in behind you to pick up garbage. So what are you? Yeah, these people, guys. Oh my God, I want to get on. I want to do one more thing before, like I, these conversations go by so fast. And I, I, I swear before, to God, before you, two... you leave, I, I have I have to correct something I, I said on education, uh -huh. if I can. Yeah. Um, so the, I just I hadn't checked it this this week, but the Department of Education has submit has created a stakeholder feedback form Ooh. on the new proposals for on the, the the proposal for redesigning the high school di diplomas. So it's on the um, uh, the DO Indiana Department of of Education website. If you in the search bar do redesign high school diploma requirements, you get it all on there. So okay, I wanted to, we're gonna we're gonna everybody share knows that. that. Yeah, I love that. We're gonna share that with the people. Okay. Uh, last questions before I get to close. You know, the beautiful part about owning your own studio is that if you run over, you just run over. Uh, when you guys are out knocking on doors or, you know, as you are crafting your campaign, there are usually about three issues um, that speak to your campaign. Um, in an elevator pitch, you know, you don't have to go fast, but what are the three things? I know we, we hit on public safety and education, but what are those things um, that is driving your campaign forward? Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. I think for me in our district, the things that I'm hearing most about is um, a desire for collaboration and uh, less chaos. Honestly, right. folks really want to see um, folk, uh, it's leaders yeah, it's working working. together for positive solutions. Um, the other piece is definitely around reproductive freedoms. Yeah. I think folks are definitely starting to understand that this isn't just about, you know, someone deciding that, you um, they don't want a pregnancy, which I still believe someone should have that choice. But we're also talking about medically necessary um, uh, procedures yeah. to save a life, yeah. to save a woman's ability to reproduce. Um, and that's becoming more and more clear. And the, and the impact it's having on on uh, doctors leaving our state and 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 that's becoming really clear, um, even more so. And it, people are scared. They're scared for their kids. And, and I used to just hear it from women and moms, and now I'm starting to hear it from dads. Love of, that. Of, too. Me too. And they're really starting to, to understand. Um, and I think the third thing is education. I really do. I think, especially out here in um, the suburbs, now I have a little bit of uh, Marion County still with, with Lawrence Township, but Folks out here are used to having their, you know, really uh, decently funded, strong, um, you know, pretty, pretty successful schools. Every school district has their issues, but they're used to that. But they're also seeing that the decisions that are being made um, by the legislature are impacting that comfort. Um, and folks don't like it. Um, they don't like their schools uh, having money taken away. They don't like um, that those resources being taken from their children. And so uh, I'm hearing a lot of that too. Wow. So that voucher program defunding public education ain't working in the burbs. Yeah. That's scary. 
That's right. So you got suburban moms wanting to have body autonomy and their kids to have all the resources. Oh, y'all don't want that smoke. Y'all don't want that smoke. Wendy, what are your three? Top three. Um, One is a a derivative of education and workforce, and that's child care. Mm. Indiana ranks 50th out of 50 states in child care, and it is impacting in, it's impacting families at many different income levels. And quite frankly, it's affecting us as women more so than it is the men. And in, 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 yeah. if someone stays home, it typically happens. So child care facilities um, is a big challenge in the child care. I'm sorry. The providers are saying we you could build me a new building and give it to me to run a child care facility. I'm not going to take it because I've got a 40% turnover as it is in my employee employee base. And that's not good for the business. It's not good for the kids that they're serving. So child care, the the supply and demand equation is not resolving itself here. So it's time for government to step in and do something. And there are some examples from around the country that, that of, of programs that states have implemented that could be helpful. So that, that one is, is universal either an employee as an employer, somebody who works on a line, whose kid, who's, who's, um, um, co-worker's kid is is ill, it affects that person. Everybody can see something in that for them. Secondly, senior issues. Ooh. Medicaid, the Pathways Program, the uh, waiting lists. I've, um, I, I went through a lot of this with my mom last year before she passed, and it was all about what does she, oh, here, go ahead, find this website, log in. Well, at 76, my mom really wasn't very good at logging into a website and understand and remembering the password and figuring out what her needs were. So we have to do a better job of taking care of our seniors. Yeah. Um, it, 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 when when Katie Wolf was a, was a senator in the Indiana State House, she had a beautiful picture on her, her wall behind her desk, and it said something to the effect, it had a child and an, an, uh, an older woman, and it said, "The sunrise, the excuse me, the sunset is just as beautiful as the sunrise." That's right. And, it, and, and I, I may not have gotten that exactly right, but that is so so true. The third area is very localized, and um, we have been duped by a former <laughs> sheriff, baby, I've and heard the tra- story, trust and accountability of our elected official elected officials but I'm going to try to stop using that term trust and accountability of our public servants that's right elected officials are public servants first and foremost first. if we can't establish that we have ethics in our elected officials who are serving the public then we are screwing up and so that is the reason that I got off the sidelines. That is it. It said, we can do better than this, Clark County. We deserve better than this. And I say Clark County, but it affects all of Southern Indiana. It affected our ambulance services, it affected our fire, our fire service. We are reeling from that. And we have a felon, an admitted felon, who on, on this coming Monday is going to get sentenced to 27 out of the 31 felony counts that w- was made against him. And we can do better than that. And that's Absolutely. that I get I get very animated about that situ that situation. As because, you should, because he yeah. stole from y'all. He stole and he is pulling so much support that we have received in growing our economy and doing things the right way. We could take six step back steps backwards because of one person's greed and the people who turn their eyes away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've heard a lot. Of, I've I've heard about him from every candidate that I've interviewed from that area. Um, not only are they disgusted, uh <sighs> They, I mean, yeah, I first heard about it from my good friend, Miguel Hampton. He was the one oh. that, yeah, that's my, that's my little bro. I love him. I didn't know that. Well, I'll have to, I'll send him a text as soon as we're yeah, done. Yeah, that's my little bro. I am crazy. Like I have to tell his wife, thank you for letting me love on him. Like I do, like I, you know, that's how much I, I dig him. Hey, but back to your senior thing. Uh, this was kind of posted today, a lawsuit was filed by 20 states challenging federal rules mandating higher staffing levels in nursing homes alleges the facility will be forced facilities will be forced to close oh, so no. <laughs> the the Biden administration said look y'all are not doing well and the residents and the family members of residents are saying that the staffing levels are too low you know the fam- my 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 person is being neglected they're not getting the care that they need and the nurses and the nursing facilities are saying, we can't meet these. 
We can't meet these requirements. And so now we're in, and of course, Todd Rakita is always wanting to put his nose in some shit. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We have a situation where what's best for the, the resident and the resident's family and what's best for the facility. So hopefully when you get in there, you will be able to have those real conversations about, you know, sunsets. And I'm be honest with you, whenever I book a vacation, I always book my vacation on the west side of the island because I want to watch a good sunset. So <laughs> Indiana, Indiana's all day in a black turn left. We just had like, yo, one of the best conversations with, uh, it, I, I shouldn't have to quantify it, but my God, just intelligent women who are on the ballot. Uh, Wendy Dan Jester, who was running in District 71, House District 71, and Stephanie Joe Yoakum, who was running in my old district, which has now been redrawn, and I can't even call it that anymore. But I, but as long as I still have paraphernalia from night 2016, um, it would also be, it would always be my district, District 88. Guys, tell the people, uh, Wendy, tell the people where they can find you. Sure. I have a, a website and it's all three names, wendydantchesser.com. And um, the most important piece of that website, if you have any questions or want to reach out, please do so through the website. It comes to me. We will get back with you. And do you have any events coming up that people need to be aware about? Um, no, I, 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 we are doing a lot of canvassing. Our get out the vote is mostly door to door. And um, we have a good effort in the ninth district down here, uh, ninth congressional district to get that done. I love that. Stephanie, tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, stephaniejoyocum.com. Um, same as Wendy, you reach out to me through that. It comes straight to my inbox. That's really important to me that I see every every uh, outreach. Um, I'm on the socials, the the Facebook, the Instagram. My team made me get on TikTok, which is new to me. Uh, um, even I ain't done that. It's an interesting place to be. Um, and we do have a, a volunteer, a super volunteer event coming up yes. on September 19th. We're going to have some pizza together. At September noon. 19th? September. No, no, no. October okay. 19th. Yeah, yeah, September was last month. I'm tired, Dana. No, I mean, ready for office ain't easy, y'all. That's why I'm so grateful. And see, this, this is what I try to tell people. I get frustrated when folks ask me who is the party running for this and who is the party running for that. No, somebody has to be willing to give up their life for 18 months to do this. This is not, you know, this ain't, oh, pick, you know, this ain't a, oh, I hope they pick me. No, this is, you have to be committed. And so I applaud you. And like both of y'all have real jobs. You have families, you have a husband, you know, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming y'all have spouses or partners or friends. You know, there's a whole life that goes on besides running for office and people forget yeah. how important it is. Thank y'all so much for joining me Thank on you. Turn Left. Don't go anywhere just yet. Guys, Woo! I'm excited. I hope you're excited too. We can end that super majority. We can hold on to a seat and flip a seat. All you gotta do is go to the polls in District 71 and District 88 and cast your vote for Wendy and Stephanie to send them to the state house. And that is one seat closer to ending the supermajority. Right now, Democrats don't even have to show up to work. They can write whatever they want, the way they want, how they want. And that's why we are now fighting for body autonomy. That is why we are fighting to fund public education because they have a supermajority. That's why the police officers couldn't say, you know, permitless carry is a bad thing or why we don't have legal marijuana. Good Lord. Every state around us is making millions of dollars off of us driving to those places because y'all know y'all smoking and chewing with your, with your gummies and your cookies and whatever. So... This is our opportunity to save democracy. This is our opportunity to flip our state house. This is our opportunity to have a win. When you cast your vote, consider the people that are looking out for you in your community. Cause them orange people, that's what I'm calling them, the orange minions. They are not, they could care less what happens to you because they would, you know, the most they would ever do is throw paper towels at you during a hurricane. I'm Indiana Zone. Thank you for tuning in to Turn Left. I will holler at y'all next week. Peace. Turn Left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.binsound.com.